since Reince Priebus left. And at that time, the president was considering both uh, getting rid of Reince Priebus as well as, as, well as uh, Steve Bannon. But at that time, he was convinced by conservatives like Congressman Mark Meadows that, in fact, it would not be well received by conservatives if they let uh, Bannon go. And so the president decided, well, okay, uh, we're going to keep him. Uh, at this point, however, uh, the insubordination, I think, is a good way to describe it, of Bannon, particularly in that interview uh, with the American uh, Prospect, in which, you know, he basically said that there is no option for us in North Korea after the president had come out with fire and fury, uh, said we're going to have a trade war with China. I think that probably didn't sit well with General Kelly, the chief of staff. You know, it's, it's very significant. In that interview, by the way, with the American prospect, uh, he did undermine the president's strategy as far as North Korea, uh, but he did not say that there were two arrogant fools, as I incorrect, incorrectly pointed out earlier. That was Robert Putner's assessment of what he right. was He said some other things that were not necessarily all that flattering, but that was uh, the, the risk of two arrogant fools blundering into a nuclear exchange. Uh, that was something that Putner wrote. I just wanted to clarify and correct that uh, so where do you th you see this going gloria well look you know i think this clearly uh bears the mark of of general kelly who wants to get this white house under control i mean you had uh steve bannon out there publicly uh saying uh, that there are no options on, on on north korea it's very difficult to work inside a white house when you've got the entire national security team trying to figure out what the options are on North Korea. And I think what Kelly is trying to do is form a White House staff that can actually work with each other instead of against each other. And um, what, he's, what he's trying to do is get rid of the factions inside the White House. And that's a really tough job, as everybody uh, sitting on, on the panel knows that there has been nothing but fighting inside that White House. And so now the challenge is to make it more cohesive around the president rather than uh, to have people have warring factions. And I think that he still probably has a way to go with that. But uh, I think in the end, the president was probably convinced that he had to do this. Uh, Gloria, stand by. I want to bring in our senior media and politics reporter, Dylan Byers who's joining us right now. Uh, Dylan, uh, this is going to shake things up. Yeah, it is going to shake things up. That's absolutely right. It's going to shake things up, not just inside the White House, but outside of the White House as well. Look, Steve Bannon is somebody who has always sort of uh, seen his life and his mission in terms of advancing you know, his version of populism and nationalism. He's always seen that in really grandiose terms. For him, you know, one, one thing he's always said is this is the top of the first inning. We're just getting started. For him, he's going to continue that effort. You saw an editor at Breitbart tweeting out war. The, the, the risk here for President Trump is that far-right media starts to go after the president. And of course, as we all know, this president with the approval rating he has certainly needs all the help he can get, certainly cannot afford to lose members uh, uh, of his base. Uh, and, and, and so, it's a, look, it's a risky proposition getting rid of Bannon. But as Gloria said, it bears all the marks of General Kelly. It's absolutely uh, right, that you could not have a White House in which you had Steve Bannon going out giving this on the record interview to American Prospect, uh, American Prospect, in which he was insubordinate. Uh, and, and so now we just have to see how that shakes out. The other thing I would just caution I think a lot of people look at Steve Bannon going out and they say, okay, is President Trump going to tone down some of the rhetoric? Are we going to, you know, is he going to be a little less alt right? Is he going to be a little uh, uh, less uh, trying to appeal to the base all the time? I don't see that. As the president himself said, uh, in his recent remarks, Bannon came on late. The, the, the remarks you get from the president, those are coming from the president himself. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't feed Bannon's departure as a change in the sort of tone and rhetoric we're seeing from this president. Yeah, fair point. Uh, I want to bring in former uh, Republican Congressman Jack Kingston, uh, Georgia. He's joining us on the phone right now. He served as a senior advisor to the Trump campaign. So how's this going to uh, play out, uh, you think, Jack? You know, I think this is part of the uh, John Kelly a footprint of getting things stable, getting things more disciplined in the White House. I have had a conversation with the White House since this was announced, and 
what they underscored is that this is operational and not philosophical. That is to say that Trump and Bannon believe in the same thing. They are populist at heart. But uh, Steve Bannon is the kind of soldier in the cause who does freelance things. And even this week had four unauthorized interviews, which were somewhat off message. And from uh, Mr. Kelly's standpoint, that's exactly the type of thing that he came to uh, his position to clean up and stop. And I think if he could send that kind of a signal in the White House that, yes, there is a new order of business around here, I think it's going to have a really big ripple effect in a positive way that, gosh, this is shocking. And, and I can tell you, you know, I was on the campaign with Steve Bannon. He was a heck of a, a field marshal, if you will. But sometimes the greatest soldiers aren't necessarily the greatest managers of, of the peace or, or the prize that you've won. But um, so the, the White House's view is this is part of what they believe they have to do to get the discipline that they need to move forward. And that, yeah. as you all know, has been one of the biggest criticisms of this White House. And what he said about North Korea was not simply off message. It was uh, very much uh, against what the president was suggesting about North Korea. Uh, Jack Kingston, I want you to stand by as well. Let, let's, let's go back to John King and the, the panel here. By all accounts, Steve Bannon, very intelligent, very experienced, not shy. Uh, he's going to have a role to play uh, now that he's on the outside, but he will still be a significant player. He's not just going to go off and retire and play golf. Oh, without a doubt, as Dylan just noted, he has his own view of nationalism and populism. It has a, it has a audience uh, in the alt-right. Some of his ideas are more democratic than Republican, uh, so they're hard to put in ideological boxes as well. Uh, what is the next chapter for Steve Bannon? It is a very important question, a big question, and what he chooses to do may have some impact on the President of the United States. I want to come back to one thing about the point Jack Kingston was just making about the White House says this is operational, not philosophical. That's fine. Uh, some of that is spin. No offense to Jack Kingston. But timing is, matters everything in life and in politics. And so when is this happening? When is this happening? So a lot of people have wanted the chaos to be dealt with a long time ago. Let's assume General Kelly gets it straight. They have a more disciplined operation. But Congress comes back. They have to do the debt ceiling spending. It's possible the first year of the Trump presidency will include zero major legis legislative accomplishments. He has poisoned the well with Republican senators by attacking Mitch McConnell specifically and then these other Republican senators. He, the reservoir of support and goodwill among Republican senators is exhausted. There's a Trump exhaustion all across the town. So even if they organizationally figure things out at the White House, have they wasted so much time that it gets late to get things done? And I know it's only August, so people watching in America start to laugh. But the midterm election year is closer and closer upon us. And this is a first-term president. You tend to get whacked in your first midterm election year, especially if you can't claim achievements. And why do you, you heard... You heard uh, uh, Jack Kingston say in his conversation with the White House just a little while ago they were irritated that uh, Steve Bannon had given four interviews without official clearance authorization from the White House chief of staff or anyone else. Absolutely. And someone made this point earlier, but it goes back to that thing of no one should be overshadowing President Trump. He sees himself as the star. And in, in these interviews, also in Bloomberg Business Week author Josh Green's book, he comes across as the guy who is working a malleable Trump, who is imprinting these ideas in his head, helping his rise come up. And that's something that the president doesn't like. So to me, there's no surprise, really, that this president, although on Tuesday he said, you know, he's a friend, he's not a racist, gave kind of a milquetoast defense of him. It doesn't surprise me that he wants to get him out of there so he doesn't have to share the spotlight. Who's going to move the agenda ball down the field? them inside this White House, I think is a big question. Think about who the closest advisors are left behind now. Jared Kushner, Ivanka Trump, Dina Powell, uh, H.R. McMaster on the national security matter, and a chief of staff uh, that is uh, John Kelly, a retired general who came from Department of Homeland Security. Where is somebody who's putting the political legislative plan together, overlaying the midterm map with understanding where the pressure points are to actually move the president's agenda ball down the field? I think that's a big outstanding question. Winners and losers. Uh, Near-term winners are Gary Cohn, Dina Powell, uh, Ivanka, Jared. Folks General like McMaster. that. General, uh, General uh, yes. But, General Kelly, but, you know, again, I think, I, look, I'm the biggest proponent of winners and losers ever, but I do think the problem with, there's only, Donald Trump is a singular figure. All presidents are, Donald Trump is more so. 
who his chief of staff is, who his communications director is. You need any evidence of that. Hope Hicks is a communications director now. What does that tell you? It means that it's essentially Donald Trump is the communications director. Donald Trump believes he is his best pollster, strategist, uh, press person. Uh, the problem, and David hits on it, is Donald Trump knows very little about the legislative process and shows very little interest. One of the reasons he struggled to sell health care reform, by the way, because when details came up with senators, he had no clue. Who does that? Is it Pence and his team who know more? It seems unlikely to be Ivanka, Jared, or any of those folks who are just not creatures of that world. We're going to stay on top of the breaking news, major breaking news, uh, Steve Bannon. Chief strategist at the White House fired. Steve Bannon, no longer the chief strategist at the White House. I'll be back 5 p.m. Eastern in the Situation Room. Thanks very much for watching. Our special coverage continues right now. This is CNN Breaking News. Here we go, top of the hour. You're watching CNN. I'm Brooke Baldwin. Another member of the president's inner circle is out. White House officials tell CNN President Trump has fired his embattled chief strategist, Steve Bannon. A source tells CNN Bannon was given the option to resign, but let's be real, he was forced out. Uh, since day one, Bannon has been a lightning rod within the Trump White House because of his alignment with the so-called alt-right movement. Uh, Bannon's firing comes just days after he gave an extraordinary yet quite candid interview that seemed to undermine the president's authority get into that in a second, but moments ago, the editor of Breitbart, this is Steve Bannon's former uh, website, tweeted this, a single word, hashtag war. Let's begin with our senior White House correspondent, Jim Acosta, live in Bridgewater, New Jersey, where the president is having this working vacation. Jim Acosta, uh, you won't, you know, beat around the bush. Man was fired. Not much of a working vacation. Yeah, not much of a working vacation for the president, and he had to deal with something uh, that was really pressing, it seems, uh, if you talk to multiple White House sources, uh, and that is the firing of Steve Bannon. My understanding from talking to a White House source is that uh, this was going to happen a couple of weeks ago, that Bannon was going to be fired a couple of weeks ago, uh, that it didn't happen, uh, and then that recently he was given the option to resign, which, you know, if you want to uh, break through the... Uh, White House speak there, and you were just doing that a few moments ago, Brooke, he was fired. He was forced out. Uh, so Steve Bannon is, is no more, but we should point out, I just talked to a, a White House source a few moments ago who spotted uh, Steve Bannon uh, getting lunch at the uh, White House cafeteria. Uh, he was smiling and in good spirits, according to this source. So he has not uh, completely left the building. Bannon has not left the building as of uh, just yet. Uh, but what this reflects, Brooke, is really a house cleaning uh, that uh, is going to be underway for some time, it seems, uh, orchestrated by this new chief of staff, John Kelly, uh, who I'm told is insisting on uh, a, a very precise power structure inside the West Wing, that people can't just walk in and out of the Oval Office, talk to the president. People can't just call the president without John Kelly being on the phone uh, uh, for the most part. And so he is trying to control the message that is coming into this White House and the message that is getting to this president. Uh, the other thing, and, and Gloria Borger and others were touching on this, Brooke, uh, as we've been reporting this over the last hour or so, uh, the, you know, Steve Bannon was freelancing. That is just something that makes, uh, can create a lot of headaches for a White House. When a top White House official is out there giving interviews, giving his opinion on things, and, and really sort of speaking on behalf of the White House, speaking on behalf of the president, and doing it in ways that, that create more heat, not less heat, uh, that is also going to create trouble from him talking to sources, uh, we understand that was also uh, irritating the president as well. And so, you know, I, I, I don't think that this should also go unnoticed, Brooke, and that is that this firing is happening, uh, and the White House is saying that Steve Bannon and John Kelly decided that this would be his last day earlier today, that this White House is firing just a few days after the president's very controversial remarks on uh, the events in Charlottesville on Tuesday. Uh, you know, I think there are going to be some people inside the White House, and I'm already starting to get an indication of this, is that the hope is, among some people inside the White House, is that Bannon's firing might, I underline might, uh, obviously, you know, this may not be a done deal, might be able to tamp down some of this controversy that is flaring up on all sides around this president right now. We'll see. We'll see. Jim, thank you so much. In New Jersey, for us, let's just dive right into this conversation. 
CNN political commentator SE Cup, host of HLN's SE Cup Unfiltered, which premieres on Monday. Also here, Tim Naftali, CNN presidential historian and former director of the Nixon Presidential Library, and Giano Caldwell, a Republican strategist. So welcome, welcome to all of you on this uh, breaking news Friday. Um, first, just SE to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, so Steve Bannon gets the door. Gets the door. Mm -hmm. What does this mean for the presidency? Mm. So uh, obviously there's there's two scenarios here. You alluded to one, maybe this starts some sort of a reset um, and maybe tamps down some of that controversy swirling around the president, what he said. The other is that Steve Bannon is still very much in touch with Donald Trump. Um, John Herman of the New York Times tweeted, great tweet, uh, Steve Bannon relegated to merely talking on the phone with the president <laughs> every day. We don't really wow. know. That tweet from Breitbart, hashtag war, makes it sound like this was not, you know, this was not a friendly departure. Mm -hmm. But we'll have to see. Steve Bannon has always had Trump's ear from the start of the campaign. And remember why he came over. He and Reince Priebus were to be this two-headed monster, sort of, in the Oval Office with Donald Trump. One representing that Breitbart wing of Trump's voter base. One, Reince representing and speaking to and for the establishment Republicans. That was always going to be a very difficult power struggle to work out. I'm just surprised it took this long for them all to go. Speaking of going, guys, throw the picture up on the screen where you see, uh, throw it up full screen. Here we go. This is in the Oval Office a time ago. So, you know, Sean Spicer, Steve Bannon. Uh, General Kelly, there's Ryan. So the, the last man standing, I should say, too, you, is the president and the vice president. Um, so just Tim, putting that in perspective, well, well, they're almost all gone. It's 10 could, little Indians. Yeah, could you imagine <laughs> George W. Bush getting rid of Karl Rove uh, eight months into his first term? I think we left the can you imagine train yeah, like, a while but, ago. But, 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 here's the, but here's the here's the thing. I, I think this was... In, there are a lot of a lot of uh, uh, trains involved, but I think this has to do with national security policy, and it is it's incompatible to go to China and want to help, ask them to help us with North Korea, while you have a major strategist, the president, who wants an economic war with China, and and I have a feeling that the reason why um, Bannon gave his uh, letter, his uh, resignation letter on August 6th, was that um, that's the same time the president said, McMaster's my guy. And there was an issue whether General McMaster would, would last. And McMaster won. And <laughs> Kelly won. And the national security for professionals, for now, won. <laughs> but I suspect, I mean, I, I put it this way, North Korea, the North Korea crisis, it may have actually led to a little bit of regime change. But it didn't happen in Pyongyang. Mm -hmm. It totally. happened in Washington. It's an excellent mm -hmm. point. The fact that Steve Bannon had this conversation with this incredibly progressive outlet and, you know, totally contradicted the president on saying there is no military solution, which obviously ticked off the commander in chief. Mm -hmm. uh, Gianno, to you, you know, I, I also saw an incredibly powerful exchange with you earlier this week. And that was part mm -hmm. of the reason why I really wanted to talk to you today, where you got very emotional. On, uh, you know, in the wake of what happened in Charlottesville, and these conversations about monuments, and that's all part of this mega conversation, yeah. because a lot of folks I've had on my show this week have said, Brooke, you know, if only Steve Bannon goes away, it will be better. Do you feel that way? Well, I'll tell you, this is the most boring White House in history. There's never <laughs> anything to report. I tell you that much. Right. Steve Who's Bannon. That? Steve Bannon is a, a very big distraction. He's been a very big distraction for quite a while, I could not tell you with certainty that him going away is going to be sufficient enough for people to take their mind off the race issue uh, for a couple of different reasons. It's going to, one, be dependent on why he was fired. What was the exact reason, which I doubt anyone in the White House would say, well, he was, you know, adding the fuel to the fire when it comes to race. I doubt that would happen. I also think when it comes to this White House and the resets, we continue to see day in and day out. Every week there seems to be a new reset. I don't have as much confidence as I used to have that one particular person leaving or one scenario occurring will allow for this White House to be on track and focused. I am very happy to see John, uh, uh, General Kelly in there making a, lo a lot of changes that are absolutely necessary, but I believe conservatives, Republicans, independents, and Democrats have lost a, a lot of confidence in this White House being on track, and unless we see 
some consistency for a long time, not just two weeks or three weeks, which I think is the longest period we've seen President uh, Trump on track in any given period. I, I don't think there's going to be much confidence to have in this administration right now, rather the White House, not just the administration. Sure. And, and let's go ahead and throw the, the Breitbart's front page up. This is this is Steve Bannon's former workplace of which, you know, he was the head, the head guy and perhaps is heading back. And you can see uh, report Bannon out of White House admitted resignation August 7th. Um, and so now he's officially out as of today, which I believe is this one year mark of being with the, the Trump train. Uh, and then the editor saying hashtag war. Do you, Essie, think, and you alluded to this a second ago, what, what, how are we supposed to interpret this, this sense of war? I mean, mm -hmm. how much to, 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 to the, I think it was a New York Times reporter yeah. tweet saying, okay, no bigs, he's just going to be on the phone with him, whispering into his ear instead of face to face, or might he be, to borrow a phrase, you know, weaponized? Yeah. Once he leaves Trump, I mean, well, there was a report. Reuters had a report that President Trump was a little scared to fire Steve Bannon because he is such powerful. a weapon. He knows a lot. He's been around Donald Trump, probably privately, quite a bit, and he has an ideological agenda. It is not just he was not just glomming on to Donald Trump like so many of those hangers on to be around the president. He really did have an ideological. Um, you know, uh, uh, exercise in mind going into the White House. And I think he's been a little disappointed by Donald Trump at times. Donald Trump has been a little disappointed by Steve Bannon at times. And so the question is, does he go back to Breitbart or somewhere else and try to weaponize and bring his agenda back to the forefront? And if even if that conflicts with where the president goes. Is this also, let me add this other layer of possibility. And again, one could argue that this is all strategy within the White House <laughs> or just totally not, okay? But the notion that... We aren't in this moment, Tim, talking about Charlottesville. I mean, uh, we alluded to it a second ago, but you know, you have all these prominent Republicans coming out, I mean, Gingrich being the latest, condemning the president for his response, but yet we're really now talking about, or most people are saying, pat on the back, Bannon's gone. I suspect that, uh, look, the, the president knew he was going to get rid of Bannon. This is a good day to get rid of Bannon. It kind of held it, waited. It, it waited, found the right moment and got rid of him. This is really, uh, Bannon, Who's a who's a smart guy? Didn't make a mistake with Kuttner. Okay, the, the, that that interview American people have described American prospect. They're making it sound as if he didn't know he was on the record. He's a he is totally a, knew he was on the record. Was, that He's... was, in my estimation, an exit interview. Right. That was him was laying him the, the seeds, laying the ground to come out of this a winner, because he can argue Donald Trump didn't fire me. I fired Donald Trump. <laughs> Remember, Bannon is the revolutionary. Revolutions need disciplined leaders. Trump has not lived up, I think, to Bannon's expectations. Mm -hmm. Bannon has an agenda which he will continue, and he laid the ground. You want to know what it is? You just read that interview. Gianna, do you agree? Do you feel like, I don't know if it's the president or just the rest of, you know, anyone who read it uh, got played by Steve Bannon? Well, uh, I mean, what's, what's really bad about this situation is not even a Steve Bannon played anyone in particular, I don't think. And that he said he I wanted to change the narrative this week. He, yeah, and he absolutely, <laughs> he absolutely changed it. No, he didn't change the narr narrative. He continued the narrative, which means confusion, consistency of confusion, always something uh, d being dumped on a Friday. We don't know what's going to happen in this White House from week to week. That's where it becomes problematic. And I'll tell you that the opposition party that President Trump often talks about, whether it be in his tweets or in interviews, isn't the Democratic Party at this point. It isn't uh, Paul Ryan or Mitch McConnell. The opposition party to Trump is Donald Trump. So there's no discipline here. And this is where it, it becomes frustrating for people like me that go on national television weekly who have defended this administration where I believe appropriate because mm -hmm. you can't, he does something good. And then the next day he's talking about Mika on, on Twitter and she, she had a facelift or whatever else. I, this is where it's a very big distraction. And if there's no discipline in this White House, I'm sure that somebody in D.C. is going to have some thoughts on how to get him out. I don't know what that's going to be, but that's what it feels like. Let me hit pause on this conversation because we're also getting more breaking news here where we're learning that more organizations have pulled out, massive organizations have pulled out of these events at Mar-a-Lago, the president's Florida, Florida's resort. We'll have that for you. More of the discussion. Stay with me on this crazy, crazy Friday afternoon. The, the breaking news we're following, Steve Bannon, uh, the uh, president's chief strategist in the White House, has now left. He is no longer the chief strategist. I want to bring in 
Robert Kuttner. He's a co-editor of American Prospect. Uh, he was uh, the uh, journalist who interviewed Steve Bannon earlier this week and caused such a huge, huge stir. Bob, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, let me get your, your immediate reaction uh, to the word that, uh, that Steve Bannon, the man you spoke to on the phone, is now officially out. Well, I'm I'm stunned. Uh, I think, as as your panel indicated, he was pretty much on the ropes before this happened. So maybe this was the last straw. But you know, the Greeks used to say that character is fate, and uh, he's been displaying a kind of recklessness, a kind of freelancing that put him on very thin ice. And I think it was only a matter of time. And the the recklessness fully on display in the conversation with me not just in terms of what he said about his colleagues, about his boss, about himself, but in terms of just neglecting to even say whether we were on the record or off the record. And this is not a rookie. I mean, it was a rookie error by one of the savviest media operators in the country, in the world. What was the most reckless thing uh, uh, that you recall uh, Steve Bannon saying about the president of the United States in that interview you had with him? Well, I think directly contradicting uh, the president's view on Korea, that was pretty reckless. Uh, I think uh, going into great detail about the infighting, uh, who he was going to get fired by name, uh, her, her job is probably as safe as anybody's job in America right now. And um, the, the fact that, you know, he had, he had problems with, with Gary Cohn, I mean, it, it was like he was taking on everybody all at once. And I think the other thing that was reckless was his assumption that because he and I happened to have a convergent critique of America China well, that I would somehow look the other way, being the editor of a liberal magazine, American Prospect, that I would somehow look the other way at all of the racism, all of the xenophobia that he's been the architect of, and, and that he could somehow... Um, BS his way into saying, oh, those people are a bunch of clowns. I mean, the things that he said about his own allies were, were pretty reckless. And I think the, uh, look, the assumption that he's going to build a grand left-right coalition for a different trade policy on China, and there have been liberal critics, I think for very good reason. I'm one of them, of, of the fact that we're letting China to take a check to the cleaners with, with American industry. Uh, but the assumption that you could you could build a, a grand left right alliance that would change this policy, I mean, think about it. You can just imagine Steve Bannon going into a meeting of U.S. Trade Rep or Defense Department or or National Security Council and saying, "All right, here's the game plan. We're going to change our whole China policy." And by the way, I've got Bob Kuttner on my side, and that doesn't exactly enhance his credibility at the Trump White House. Yeah, I, and on North Korea. Uh, the, the interview occurred after the president said fire and fury, after the president said the U.S. military was locked and loaded. And in the interview with you, he said, uh, this, this is Steve Bannon, there's no military solution to North Korea's nuclear threats. Forget it. Until somebody solves the part of the equation that shows me that 10 million people in Seoul don't die in the first 30 minutes from conventional weapons, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no military solution here, they got us. That is in total contradiction to what the president was suggesting in the days leading up to that interview. That must have so startled you to hear that from Steve Bannon. Well, not only did it startle me, but it was also a lot saner as policy than the president's own view. So, one, well, one question I have that uh, I think was implicit in the discussion before you brought me in um, Trump is famous for having back-channel conversations with anybody and everybody in his circle. So even if Trump is forced out as the official political strategist, is Trump going to continue to have back-channel conversations with him? Because Bannon is the architect of the strategy of getting into bed with the far right. Uh, ever since the initial events in Charlottesville, Trump has been doubling down on that, I would assume, with with Bannon's encouragement, or, or if not explicit encouragement, Bannon's fingerprints are on that. What does he do now with Bannon out with this strategy of becoming more and more reckless himself about stoking up the neo-Nazi right? What's that going to be like without Bannon there to hold his hand and walk him through it? Or is Bannon still going to be there at the end of a phone? Because there are several people who have been fired uh, or have resigned from uh, this president, either during the campaign 
or since he became president, and the president still maintains, you're absolutely right, that back-channel communication. And so you suspect that the, the communication with Steve Bannon will continue, even though he is out officially from the White House. Well, I think it makes the White House itself more chaotic, but uh, it also means that Trump is even more reliant on all of these back channels. And I think the man of the hour is General Kelly. I mean, what is he going to do? If, if he had not succeeded in uh, enforcing Trump out, it would have shown that he's impotent. So now we know that he has some power, but does he have enough power given all of the propensities of the president? You know what, I, I want to just play for you, uh, Bob, what the president of the United States in that off-the-rails news conference he had Tuesday in the lobby at Trump Tower, he was asked about Steve Bannon's future, uh, and his words were pretty precise. Listen to this. Look, I like Mr. Bannon. He's a friend of mine. But Mr. Bannon came on very late. You know that. I went through 17 senators, governors, and I won all the primaries. Mr. Bannon came on very much later than that. Uh, and I like him. He's a good man. He is not a racist. I can tell you that. He's a good person. He actually gets a very unfair press in that regard. But we'll see what happens with Mr. Bannon. But he's a good person, and I think the press treats him, frankly, very unfairly. We'll see what happens. Uh, and our Jim Acosta, our senior White House correspondent, Bob, is reporting that Bannon was supposed to be fired two weeks ago. That, according to a White House official, but that firing was put off. Uh, but go ahead and react. I wonder what you thought when you heard the president say, we'll see what happens, Steve Bannon, because that's, to me, that was a sign he's gone. Yeah, and it's even more uh, vivid in hindsight. That's what you say when you got, you're about to give somebody a gold watch. Uh, Bob Kuttner, uh, th thanks so much for joining us. Uh, he's the uh, co-editor of The American Prospect. He did that very, very important interview the other day with Steve Bannon. And that interview, uh, by all accounts, Bob, uh, I'm sure had a role to play in the decision today uh, that Steve Bannon is no longer the, uh, the senior strategic advisor to the president of the United States. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye. You know, when, when the president said, John King, that uh, we'll see what happens, we knew what was going to happen. We, we did. I just want to quickly say I read Bob Kuttner for 20 years plus years now, one of the more thoughtful people in the progressive movement, even if you're a conservative, especially on economic policy, uh, that, that he's in the middle of this, given the liberal American prospect, talking to the alt-right Steve Bannon, the ironies, Washington is a very different place in this environment. But to the point that that sound you just played from the president, this is part of the issue and part of the question, and it goes well beyond Steve Bannon. He's asked about Steve Bannon. And he's, essentially, the president says, I did this. He came on late in the campaign. Uh, it's always about the campaign. He's been president of the United States for seven months. He has zero significant legislative achievements. None of his signature campaign promises have made it to the finish line. And you ask him a question about something that's going on in his White House, and it's always back to the campaign. Uh, this is the fundamental problem of the Trump presidency. Not who's the chief of staff and who's the chief strategist. That is not to understate the drama of this moment and the significance of somebody as larger, or actually a larger-than-life figure, of Steve Bannon being shown the door. But the new chief of staff, maybe he picks a new strategist. Maybe he works with the president on that. It's not about the personnel. It's about the president. Uh, and and the, every answer goes back to the campaign. The campaign's over. He's president. Obamacare is still the law of the land. Tax reform is nowhere. He had an event the other day that dissolved into what you just played us there that was supposed to be an infra infrastructure. That plan doesn't even exist. I do wonder at some point, I know the Trump voters are incredibly personal and loyal to this president. At some point, they're good people. They're common sense people. They can do the math. They're going to ask, what happened? To, I'm going to run it like a business. What happened to Washington is stupid, and I know how to fix it. Uh, where is that? Uh, to Bob's other point about the outside circle of advisors, I think he raises a key question because the president does still talk to Corey Lewandowski from the campaign, to Dave Bossy from the campaign. Uh, now will Steve Bannon get added to that list? I think it's a fair question. You know, he's presumably, I don't know if he will, uh, but he was one of the leaders of Breitbart, uh, which uh, uh, is reacting. And I want to show you, want to show our viewers a tweet uh, that just came out uh, by one of the senior editors, one of the top uh, top. Uh, Writers at Breitbart from Joel Pollack, uh, you see that hashtag war, hashtag war. Uh, that is a, a pretty strong statement. Point, doesn't it? I, one of the biggest questions I've had as we kind of wonder when, not if, but when Steve Bannon would be out of this White House, is how the conservative media will respond, and particularly Breitbart, 
which is some, a, a place that's been promotional of this president. What will they do? Will you see them start to turn on Trump? And I think that Joel's tweet there says the answer is undoubtedly yes. He is not going to have a soft landing in these places because the, Steve Bannon is one of their own. He has been rejected, and they now feel isolated, and they feel like this is a president they boosted, they and their, their ilk boosted, and now they're being tossed out of the inner circle, and they don't seem to like it. And this was always the danger of bringing in Bannon, right? I mean, the, the, that it would end in this way almost inevitably, but that the outcome there when you do that with someone with the ties that he has to Breitbart and into the broader uh, movement there is that this happens and that they turn on you. Uh, one thing I'll say, and I, I keep coming back to and John's made this point, is Donald Trump is the only advisor that matters in the White House. If you've learned anything, if, I guess if I've learned anything seven months of this presidency, it's, it's that. It's that John Kelly has said privately, semi-publicly, I'm focusing on the of staff part. That we're going to try and get the staff in order. Departures, uh, Anthony Scaramucci, though, sort of departed himself, uh, and Steve Bannon. Makes some sense. But the, the, the central guy, the guy who's not going to disappear from any pictures in the Oval Office, is Donald Trump. Uh, theoretically, could Mike Pence have some influence on him? Sh sure, though Mike Pence has been his most ardent, steady defender, even as it related to Charlottesville and his comments there, lack thereof. So what's difficult is we debate all this stuff. I don't think it is beneficial to Donald Trump to have Breitbart on the outside, to have Bannon on the outside. At the same time, you know, there's a lot of Bannon's views in Donald Trump, whether they were there, whether Bannon cultivated them. Regardless, there's a lot of Steve Bannon in the one guy that we know who matters in the White House. And you know, what was, what was significant was that as we speak right now, the president's at Camp David with a couple dozen uh, of his top advisors, cabinet officials, national security officials. And when the White House earlier today released the list of who was participating to discuss the future of Afghanistan and other critically important issues, Steve Bannon's name was not there. No, it's a uh, principals meeting in the National Security Council. And you recall, this was a controversy was at the very once. beginning of the administration. He was once on that and then removed from it. Uh, had this meeting taken place at the beginning of this administration, Steve Bannon would have been there. The Breitbart reporter for the White House, Charlie Spearing, uh, his tweet uh, along the lines of what you just showed, and kids, that's the day when Bannon the Barbarian was born. Uh, that, and and I, whether or not that, that power that Bannon might have on the outside is going to be aimed at Donald Trump, or to John King's point earlier, more aimed at Jared Kushner, yep. Ivanka, Gary Cohn, Dina Powell, the globalists in, uh, in the mind of uh, Bannon, uh, you know, I, I don't I know that John Kelly be, too. I don't know that it'll be directly aimed at the president. But if you're around the president and considered uh, anathema to the Bannon worldview, uh, I would watch out. Like you're going to have some you know, coming. John, let's not forget the, the week that this is all taking place. What happened this week? Uh, an amazing historic week. The reaction of the president to the to the disaster, uh, to the tragedy that occurred in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, and culminating with a whole bunch of Republicans strongly condemning the President of the United States, including Mitt Romney, are only today issuing a statement whether he intended to or not. What he, the President, communicated caused racists to rejoice, minorities to weep, and the vast heart of America to mourn. Make a key point, the President of the United States. I think that's been the recurring theme here. Uh, you can change personnel, and maybe this is necessary. The President, this will give some moderate Republicans especially who view Steve, who viewed Steve Bannon as toxic from day one, and who maybe don't like to go out and criticize the president, who are getting asked about what he said Tuesday, the moral equivalency of the counter demonstrators to the KKK and the neo Nazis. It'll give them to say, well, this is a positive change by the president. But, but it is the president. It is the president. Uh, and with this further fracturing, Breitbart is now at war. Uh, Breitbart was on his side for the first seven months. Right? Does, if you further fracture the conservative Republican, what you want to call a conversation, does that help you or hurt you when you're trying to get votes for Obamacare? I would argue it hurts if you're in this mess. Does it help or hurt when the conservatives come back next week and say, we're not going to vote to raise the debt ceiling unless we get offsetting spending cuts? A recurring drama we've heard throughout Republican years in Washington, but now you have a Republican president. So administration that has zero significant legislative achievements before you now is in a more messy environment even on its side, the part that it has been able to keep together. The Trump base has been solid. His other poll numbers are terrible. The Trump base has been relatively solid from day one. Does this impact that? It's a question mark. But if it does, 
it further hurts a president to deeply and profoundly wounded right Just now. Just by the way, one quick thing. I mean, it, there's so much news every week, it's hard to remember all. John is 100% right. Let me just add other Attacking Mitch McConnell repeatedly, the Senate Majority Leader last week, uh, reading out his support for Kelly Ward, a primary challenger to a sitting incumbent. Attacking Lindsey Graham, uh, another sitting incumbent. This is not the way for someone who has no legislative accomplice or someone who we really don't know ideologically what the way forward is, and we certainly don't know legislatively what the way forward is. It's easy to say, we're on to tax reform. Well, what and how? Uh, presidents who are much more legislatively versed than Donald Trump have failed at that. Right. You also have the fact that this is someone, I forgot to mention, Lisa Murkowski, Ben Sass, Susan Collins. Uh, uh, there are a lot of senators who Donald Trump has insulted in literally the last three weeks much less since he's been in office, yeah. that he's 